Hi everyone. My name's Heather. Thanks for coming today. I feel so honoured to talk to you um, today about my favourite topic, Islam. So, the topic is how did I come to Islam? Well, a while ago I was dating a Muslim guy and obviously wanted to learn more about Islam. But he couldn't answer my questions. So I enrolled in a course um, with the Auburn Mosque and I absolutely loved it. The course started off with why I believe God exists, why we believe God exists. I learned that there are signs in nature that point to God, God's existence, um, since everything is created so perfectly. Obviously Islam is not the only religion that teaches this concept, but to me it was a new concept. Um, and it really got me thinking. For example, if the oxygen content was changed even slightly in the atmosphere, we wouldn't be able to breathe. If the earth was not on the angle it was, we wouldn't be able to survive. If the atmosphere didn't have the content it did, um, you know, meteors would penetrate. There's so many different examples. The perfection in the ecosystems. How many different ecosystems there are on this earth? We can't even imagine. You drive 100 kilometres and then there's a new ecosystem. But you don't even notice the change. It happens so gradually. All the animals in each ecosystem are in perfect balance. That one animal will eat another animal and then all the species are in perfect um, numbers of the species until humans obviously come in and introduce animals that aren't part of that ecosystem. But everything's in perfect balance. The miracle of one flower, how it's grown from one seed to a perfect flower with light and water and everything else that it needs that I probably don't even understand. The human body, like the amazing components inside all our body for us to be able to live. Um, I had a test the other day, a blood test, and I looked through a microscope to see what's inside one drop of blood. It was a mind boggling. Um, and the naturopath actually said to me, if anyone doesn't believe in God, well, here's the proof. Um, the birds that know instinctively where to go to when they migrate. So the more I reflected on the perfection of nature, the more I realised how intricate and detailed it is. I studied geography, I did my honours in geography, but um, I've never looked at it from this point of view. So how could this all come into existence by chance? How amazing the Creator must be to create it all so perfectly. So that started me thinking about God and the existence of God. A few weeks later we started learning about the Quran. And this is what really made me know that Islam was for me. I'm a police officer, I like evidence. And for me, the Quran is proof that God exists and that it's the word of God. We learned that Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of God for many reasons. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made sure scribes wrote down the revelation as he received it. Um, every year, Muhammad, peace be upon him, checked the Quran um, with the angel Gabriel to make sure it was right. And every Quran in existence is exactly the same in Arabic. Um, and we actually have two of the original copies of the Qur'an. Also, no one's been able to write a verse like the Qur'an. Um, people have tried and during the time that it was revealed, poetry was massive then. Um, and so, a lot of people said, well, Prophet Muhammad's just a poet, he's just made up these words. Um, and many sceptics tried to prove that it wasn't from God. But they couldn't because of the eloquence, because of the language. Um, and many converted to Islam because of that. But the most convincing thing for me of the Qur'an is that the abundance of scientific facts in the Qur'an that they couldn't have known about 1400 years ago. Um, and now science is proving that everything in the Qur'an is true. The Qur'an talks about the three stages of pregnancy, describing the fetus at each stage and what it looks like. They, possibly, they couldn't possibly have known that 1400 years ago. Uh, it says the seawater and freshwater when joined will not mix. And now they've proven that when seawater and freshwater mix, it's like there's a barrier there which the Quran talks about. They don't actually mix. Um, they certainly didn't know that 1400 years ago. It also talks about the Quran being the shape of an ostrich egg, which is not completely oval, but uh, not completely round, just slightly oval. And that's, science says that's the shape of the earth. I find this all ama absolutely amazing. And I love that Islam brings science and God together. Because often people talk about science, um, you have to have either science or God. But we need science to explain God's creation, and they're not in conflict at all. So once I was convinced that the Quran was the word of God, I accepted everything in the Quran was from God, and that it should be put into practice. I remembered back to when I first read the Quran, you know, a year or so ago, before I started this course. Um, and what stood out for me was how often uh, the Quran said, adhere to your prayers and give charity. To me it felt like that was every second sentence. I look back now and it's not every second sentence, but that's what stood out for me the first time I read it. And in class we were learning how important prayer is and that it's the most important act that we can do. It's the foundation for everything else. I realise why now, 
But at the time, I thought, praying five times a day, that is ridiculous. That's way over the top. Surely God doesn't want us to pray five times a day. How difficult it must be to um, find time to find the place. And it must actually be stressful. Well, I was quite wrong. Um, but I believed in the Quran, and I knew that God places an importance on prayer. So I thought, I'll just give it a go. And I'm very glad that I did. Um, I, I can't describe the amazing benefits of prayer five times a day. Now I would never dream of not praying as I absolutely love it. I look forward to it. Um, I love praying and I feel so calm, so peaceful, so connected with God when I pray and even when I finish as well. My colleagues even notice the difference. One day I was in the office, I'd just come back from somewhere, I was complaining about a new process that was being implemented, which I shouldn't have been doing, we shouldn't complain, that's a waste of energy. But um, I was, and one of the guys at work said to me, have you taken your 10 minutes out yet? It was about lunchtime. And he was referring to praying. I said, no, I haven't. And he said, all right, go take your 10 minutes and then come back and talk to me. And, um, and I said, all right, but I'll still be angry about this. And he just goes, we'll see. So this demonstrates the importance of prayer and that even other people can notice the reasons why we pray. It's time out from the world. It it's disconnects us from these silly little things that we get caught up in. Who cares about a new process? You know, it's, t it's time out to thank God, to be in connection with God, to feel peaceful, to feel calm, um, and to thank God and, and ask for forgiveness five times a day. It's so peaceful, so meditative. It's like forced meditation five times a day. Now, obviously, I can't imagine life without prayer, um, and it has so many more benefits that I can't describe in 15 minutes, but I love it. The same with fasting. Again, I thought, there's no way God wants us to fast from sunrise to sunset for 30 days. Um, I'm sure you really look Muslim, but um, for those people who aren't Muslim may not know what Ramadan is, we fast from sunrise to sunset um, for 30 days in the lunar month of Ramadan each year. Um, I thought, oh, it's dangerous. That's not good for you not to eat. Um, how am I supposed to do my job properly? Now, I'm the type of person that needs to eat every couple of hours, or I get narky, grumpy, irritable, feel like I have no energy, I can't concentrate. It's so bad that when I'm at work, if I say, oh, I'm feeling a little bit hungry, people will actually go and get me food, insist that I eat, because I'm a different person when I don't eat. Um, if a new person is working with me, my colleagues have said, as long as she's fed, you'll have a good shift. <laughs> and I used to accept that, but now I realise that I was just letting my stomach rule my life, and that's not good. So I was very sceptical about fasting, very, very sceptical. But again, I accepted the Quran as the word of God and thought, all right, I'll be fasting and go. And wow, what a great time Ramadan is. Now I realise it's the highlight of the Muslim's year. We don't dread it, we look forward to it. Fasting is amazing. It's self-discipline, it's connection with God, it reduces our desires, it's such a spirit, spiritual feeling. And scientific studies actually show that fasting benefits the digestive system and gives it a rest. Especially mine must have needed it, being on overdrive as I was always eating. So, um, so since I've been fasting, I'm no longer ruled by my stomach. If I miss lunch at work, I don't get narky or irritable. I just think to myself, I don't need it. I fast all day during Ramadan. It's fine. Um, and you know what? I, it's not even that hard anymore. And people have noticed at, wor uh, um, at work have noticed if I miss lunch, they'll say to me, oh, you've done really well today. You haven't been grumpy at all. Because they remember the old Heather that was such a pain with to work with if I wasn't fed. I just think it's very embarrassing. But for me now, Ramadan's truly the most wonderful time of year. And I was actually a bit depressed this year when Ramadan was over because it's such an amazing spiritual feeling. Um, so my life continues accepting what God tells me to do. And I now trust that whatever God tells me to do is best for me because it keeps proving to be true. Everything I give a go, um, God gives me such an abundance of rewards. Next, I learned about the importance God places on those who are patient. Patience was not my strength at all, and still, in fact, isn't. My supervisor at work used to tell me I needed to work on my patience. Um, and, you know, being a police officer, that could be dangerous in a siege situation if, if I wasn't patient with, some, patient with someone. Um, I had bad road rage. I need to tell you, I still do, probably. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I... And I was kind of impatient with people. But... Again, in the Quran, um, the Prophet Muhammad comes to point and talks about patience so much. So I thought, all right, I've got to force myself to be patient. Now I realise, thank God, if someone's driving slowly, just be patient. It's all right. It's going to cost me, what, 30 seconds maybe if someone's driving slowly in front of me? Um, and maybe not even because they might turn off and then I'll catch up anyway. 
Um, and even if it does take 30 seconds, it was meant to be. Maybe it prevented us from an accident. Who knows? We don't know what's going what's gonna to happen. It's not worth getting the, the negative um, stress anyway. It's much more better to be patient. And God knows best, and I'm glad that I've tried to implement that. Um, I still need help. I can't tell you how good it is to put my trust in God um, and to know that everything happens for a reason and that every opportunity is a chance to um, learn and develop. And now I ask God to continually test my patience because I want to improve my patience and, and learn to be better. We need these tests and trials in life to develop um, and this is an important concept in Islam. As I continued my course, course we learnt about the prophets, peace be upon them all, and the holy books. Muslims have to believe in all the prophets, Moses, Jesus, Abraham, David, Noah, um, and all the others must be upon them all. We believe that the Torah and the Bible are God's holy books. We know, however, that because care wasn't taken to preserve them and things are lost in uh, translation and the originals aren't in existence, that perhaps there's human error involved in them. But we believe in them, we accept them as God's scriptures and that the prophets um, gave, were given the messages from God. I love this about Islam, it accepts every religion and promotes tolerance between religions and interfaith dialogue. Judaism, Christianity, Islam and all other religions share the same belief in being non-judgmental of others, in belief in God, giving charity and treating people with respect. Um, Islam teaches that believers need to come together and focus on our similarities, not our differences. And I love this about Islam because it brings us all together, believers, um, and that all the religions are giving the same messages. But probably what I love best about Islam is the peace and contentment I found. I used to be the biggest stress head. I'd stress about anything, worry about the future, worry about things that probably weren't even possible, and I was very highly strung. I was very easily annoyed by little things, traffic, people asking silly questions, what I thought was a silly question. It's, it's a horrible way to be. But today I have peace and calmness in my life. And people have even commented on it, which for me is amazing because I used to admire calmness in other people because I had none. An atheist said to me recently, um, I see how Islam is good for you. Before you were Muslim, you were very short with people. Um, but now I know that every situation in life is an opportunity to learn and it's from God and it's a blessing. So I've continued taking on what Islam prescribes bit by bit, realising that everything I put into practice gives me abundant rewards. Everything I do makes me feel closer to God, feel peaceful, feel calm and content. I can't describe to you the happiness I feel from practising Islam. And what's wonderful is that Islam has answers for everything and ways to continue, um, for us to continue striving to be better always. It never has to end. Um, so in case you're wondering, I'm no longer with that boyfriend. We broke up for a few reasons, but one of the biggest concerns for me was that he wasn't practicing Islam and, and never started to. I'm now looking and praying for a man who will love Islam as much as me and who wants to continue learning about it and putting it into practice for our whole life and who I can grow and develop with through the principles of Islam. Thank you.
um, because the church uh, was teaching Vietnamese alongside the services. So we attended the services and it was funny because while we were going to church, we used to wreak havoc. We used to run around and steal stuff, like little cars and, and tease people. And we would dub the devil children. That's quite funny. But um, after a while we, we left, uh, we, we stopped going. And this is when we moved houses. We used to live in Canterbury, but uh, we moved to where we live now in the Kemba, which is across the street from the mosque. And since we've settled in, uh, we've had a number of people approach us to swap houses, and uh, and one of them uh, offering their car alongside a townhouse for our small apartment. And uh, we we're wondering why it was so important to have this location. But I I knew I didn't want to swap because it would, it would mean that I would have to move again, and it would move me further away from the train station, which was a hassle because I was going to high school. Um, and we were living there for a few years and, I, and nothing really noticed what happened and it was just really a build up of exposure to Islam so I was hearing the, the call to prayer daily I was seeing a lot of people practicing Islam a lot of people uh, saying Islams to each other uh, being kind and gathering after prayer so there was, there was usually a, a bunch of people outside the mosque five times a day and I wouldn't understand why and it was not until year 11 that I met someone uh, through this business program and she was wearing her hijab which I didn't see much outside of the Kemba so, and I didn't understand the reason behind that so I asked her and I remember our art teacher said it was adopted because uh, Muslims had to hide their identity in fear of persecution and from raiders which I thought was very ironic given today's criticism to it Anyway, I got in contact with his sister a few times until another sister had recommended to her that I, um, to talk to a brother. And, uh, and this brother helped me out a lot. He's actually supposed to be here today, but he's quite busy. Um, but from here, things started to pick up. I started attending these fortnightly talks and learned about different aspects of Islam. And I remember it was awkward for me when everyone would pray. Uh, because these talks were during the night and they would have to pray the modern prayer. And I asked myself if I should do what everyone's doing, pretend that I know what I'm doing, <laughs> or just wait and sit out. But I would end up sitting out each time. Anyway, what I loved about going to these talks was that the more I learned, the more I wanted to know. And in a way, it was, very, it was just fascinating to hear about the angel of death or, or, or anything to that extent after having no knowledge whatsoever about hearing about the hereafter or the unseen. In a way it was how I was drawn to Islam at the very beginning because uh, my neighbour, when he heard that I was interested in Islam, he gave me a, a welcome package uh, which included a Quran, a mini Quran, a prayer map, a supplication book and this children's book. Uh, it was the illustrated guide to Islam and it was a very colourful book and some of the pages were ripped out and it had texted drawings on it but um, I got the, the crux of what he was saying it provided a lot of the scientific uh, miracles like the first speaker said in the Quran and it was one of the more convincing texts that I read and from that I obviously delved into more, um, more advanced reading and read a lot on the internet as well and after after reading a lot on the scientific aspect, the same brother that first introduced me was um, he gave he suggested to me to learn the linguistic aspect as well, so uh, rational deduction, logical proving, and, and so forth. So he gave me this really small book. Uh, it's about four pages, I think, but those four pages were the most intense reading I've done on uh, logical lo logical reasoning. <laughs> And, and what I liked about reading these books was that it made a lot of sense talking about uh, the limited and dependent nature of living things and enlightened thought. It provided me a lot more than it's just faith, so believe everything. So I went to these talks for about a year and uh, reading further, I decided I was ready enough and because it felt, it felt right and 
he had a lot of reason. So I contacted the brother I first met and told him I was ready. He set a date and told me to shower beforehand. And, and I showed up wearing a nice shirt, some nice pants, went to the centre and I called him and said that he, he was too busy to organise something. So I went home uh, feeling that that wasn't the day. And he told me that we'd organise it for a different day. And that day came, being the first day of Ramadan, on 2009, but but yeah, so I guess it worked out in the end. So I went through the process of uh, taking the shahada at, in front of a group of brothers, and upon doing so, I felt uh, a huge feeling of a, few, a huge feeling of relief. And as cliche as it sounds, like a, I, it's like I took a deep breath, deep long breath after being underwater for so long, and. All of this was also recorded, but I haven't had the chance to receive it yet. The brother hasn't received it, uh, sent it to me. Uh, so after some hugs and the brother who came after it was finished, uh, I went home feeling really, really good. Uh, when I got home, my mom was sitting in the lounge room. She said, she told me, you know the Muslims have started fasting today? And I replied, yeah, so am I. And she said, what? Well, you're not Muslim. And I replied, here I am. I became one today. And it probably wasn't the best way to tell my mom that I became a Muslim and changed my way of life. But at that point, I, I just didn't think about what I was saying. I was just so happy. Um, after hearing that, my mom went quiet, which I thought was uh, my cue to go to my room, thinking it'd be over after that. Uh, I saw her get up, so I stopped. She told me that I couldn't be Muslim because it is the religion of the Arabs. She told me that I have to follow Buddhism because I'm Vietnamese, because it is my religion because I'm Vietnamese. She told me that under this roof, there could only be one religion. Of course I refuted, I told her that Islam is a religion for everyone, and after that things got a little heated, and, ended up, and I ended up going to my room and kind of secluding myself. After that, the first couple of days seemed okay, because I was out of the house, so there wasn't much contact with my mom. But there was that one day that I was at home, and she was at home for the whole day. And I was fasting that day as well because she was doing Ramadan as well. Uh, I remember she had bought me food uh, and told me to eat. I told her that I was fasting, I couldn't eat until later on. And she got upset, and she said that she didn't like this. Uh, as a motherly instinct that would want to you know, see their children eat, especially their own food. Um, so she asked me uh, how all people would handle fasting or how people could handle fasting while working. And I told her that there are certain concessions for old people, but also for the people that are actually fasting, it's, it's far beyond just physically starving oneself. And she told me, well, if you're starving yourself, then I'm going to starve myself as well. And, and we'll see what happens, because she's getting quite old, so... And then she stormed out of the room. She left me alone for a while, but only to come back later. She put the ball down on my table again, demanding me to eat. She said, eat this. If you don't, I will kill myself. So she, she threatened to take her own life, and did so again later on during the week. She told me that I had a choice between keeping Islam or her, for me to either renounce Islam or for her to kill herself. She wanted me to undo what I had done that day. The, si the situation quickly got emotional and fiery, so I told her that I needed some time. Even though I knew that there was no way I was going to renounce Islam, I just needed to buy some time that she would calm herself down. So I went and called the, the first brother that had introduced me to Islam and and told him the situation. He advised me to do what I had been doing, which was to just leave the premises and to make sure that contact is at a minimal. And from there, things, things were okay as long as I went at home. There were times that uh, I remember I had to go office works to get some stationery. I went with my mom and I was still on my L's that time. So I was driving and when we, when we got to Office Works, she 
Well, I, I told her um, that that I'm still fasting, and and we're in the car park of Office Works, and she just got angry again, and she said the same arguments pretty much, and said that under the same roof uh, they can only be one religion. And I said, what if I move out? And she she didn't like this as well, so it just got quiet. And then she's like, okay, do you want to drive home? I'm like, no, nah, you drive home. I just want to sit in the back and not talk to you. But uh, during the rest of the month, my game plan was pretty much the same. It's just to stay out, stay out, and just uh, do stay at the library, maybe read read and do my work there, and then go home late when my mom's already asleep. And that was pretty much the gist of it. Uh, there were times that my mom caught me praying at home. Uh, I don't know why I prayed at home. I think it was because I was too embarrassed to pray at the mosque. But um, after she confiscated my welcome package from my neighbor, which included the prayer mat, uh, I used the towel on the carpet to pray. And, and when she walked in, after I finished praying, she said, do not let me catch you doing that again. Uh, it, was a, it sounded like an empty threat, which it was because it, after that she didn't really catch me again because I'd go to the mosque. But, but there was still some aggression during that month. Um, but, during, but in between then and now, there's been a lot of change. Last, last year there was still a bit of uh, aggression as it was the anniversary of that fight. But, um, but this year has been a, a big improvement. As uh, when I was walking home this, this year during Ramadan, I, went, I passed my mom. And she asked me, do you want me to make you food for work the next day? Because she makes my food for lunch. And I said, I should said this knowing that I was I would be fasting, and I said no, I should be okay. And she said, okay, in that case, I'll make you food for when you wake up to eat. And I was like, Subhanallah, uh, I've I've come so far. I um, mean, my mom's making halal food. She stopped buying our pork products. Uh, when I walk out of the house, I would be going to the mosque, and my mom would know this because before she'd always ask me where are you going um, always wanting to know where I am but now she's just trusting me knowing that I've become a better person and she's seen this as well she said that oh you know I've really seen you change and so when I was walking home that day when I passed my mum uh, I had tears in my eyes because I didn't realise how far I'd come so I was just kind of it's been a it's been a far far journey, but I've made it, and I'm going to continue learning. Thank you. Um, this is okay for that, um, Dr. Peter. Um, very very inspiring. I think must be so much hardship and yet he's still he's still keeping strong to the end. It's very inspiring. Um, now I've got Sister Aisha, round of applause. How are we going with the time? Uh, excellent, thank you. Can you tell me more about yeah. Hello, Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Aisha and um, I have you to move that standing behind this. I don't know, maybe it's because I'm half Italian, I like to use my hands a lot. You know? <laughs> I don't know, I feel more free than that. Anyway. Thanks for coming and I've really enjoyed these two talks. It's very, very inspiring. Um, let me begin. Um, I'll take you back on a journey to how I um, reverted to Islam many, many years ago. Oh, okay, I'll speak up. Oh, okay. All right. If you just, how about I, hi, I raise my voice and you tell me up the back. Can you hear my voice now? Yes! <laughs> okay, look, I'm a teacher by profession so I can have a loud voice if I need to. So, okay. Um, all right, so let me begin. Um, when I was 19, uh, in my early days at Sydney University, I came from a background, I've got 10 brothers and sisters, dad's Muslim, mum's Catholic, we were raised as Catholic, um, both my parents were not particularly religious, so they raised us on very good morals and principles, and um, basically let us discover and take our own path when the time came. So throughout high school I went to a Catholic school. Um, I can 
pretty much embarrassingly say that I was an atheist for most of those years, only because even those, though my friends were pretty strong Catholics, um, generally speaking, most people, or most teenagers, didn't really talk about God. Religion was something you did, you know, occasionally. Uh, it was more Christmas and Easter. Um, and to be honest, when we used to um, go to church, I didn't find myself connecting with a lot of the themes, particularly the Trinity. Though I did believe in Jesus and I did believe in Mary, Elisa, and I, I did believe that they must have been on this earth, they must have been great personalities, um, and they had very esteemed qualities. Um, but my idea of God was muddled. I basically thought God was, um, you know, someone who was this very huge, um, I, well, I didn't have a form, but I thought in the image of a man, you know, someone who lived in heaven. Right? That was my understanding of God because of, the, um, because of it being connected with um, Jesus as a son of God. So it limited my understanding of what God was. Um, so in that respect, I had a lot of, um, uh, uh, a lot of ideas that didn't um, make sense to me, for example, and a lot of um, queries against, well, if there is a God, why is there poverty on the planet? Why, you know, did that person just get run over and they're five years old? Why, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? It didn't. Ma it seemed to make sense to me. So anyway, as um, in my second, in my first year of uni, I found myself starting to question things about the end of my life. You know, it's funny. They say when you're at uni, all of a sudden you start thinking about, wow, you know, I made it to uni. You know, I've got my whole life ahead of me. You know, and then you think, what do I want my life to be about, right? And I, I, I started thinking along those lines. But then I started thinking about, because here I was, you know, this 19-year-old um, person who wanted to have a very ambitious, wealthy, um, I was very um, career-oriented and whatnot, wanted to be very successful. Um, and so, I, I, you know, here I was asking myself, okay, so let's just say I achieve all the things I want, and then what? And then I die. So what was it all you know, worth it? Was it all worth it? You know? I started thinking about death because I, I didn't experience death growing up. I didn't have relatives or anyone who had died. So I started thinking about um, what's going to happen to me, right, when I die. And um, I also at that time, right, and, and at that time I started thinking about is this the end or be all of life? You know, is it just here and that's it, right? Didn't, didn't sit well with me. So there was something missing, you know, in my understanding of, of everything that, 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 that's happening. I, I, met some, um, I met some Muslims for the first time in my life, and um, they were two girls, and they had the most beautiful smile you can ever imagine. And, um, and the great thing about them is that um, they were not judgmental. So here I was in my shorts and sandals and hanging out with them, and they had no discomfort whatsoever in being my friend. So I felt very comfortable to ask them about, you know, um, well, it wasn't so much asking, I was more interested in them as a person, to be honest, initially, and getting to know them more. And during that time, because I was doing a Bachelor of Arts in Economics, Government and Islamic Studies, right? Um, so I had the opportunity to study um, Islam, and probably the aspect of Islam that caught my heart the most was um, the concept of God, you know, the mystical side of Islam. Who is God in Islam? I found myself spending hours and hours at the Fisher Library immersing myself in books and, um, and authors who, who talked about God in ways that I never imagined someone could talk about God. And, um, and so it basically expanded my um, understanding and at the same time touched certain chords within me that made me start to feel something about, well, maybe God does exist, you know. Um, and, um, and so I started reading more, and I, I just as um, you know, our previous two speakers were saying, there were a lot of aspects that I felt answers, all the logical things, because I'm also someone who needs to have, you know, it has to be foolproof for me, you know, in terms of all the facts and evidence, it has to make sense. So I went through that whole process, as most new Muslims do, where it's like, yep, that makes so much sense, yep, that makes so much sense. And I'm saying by experience as well. It's, it's enough, it's one thing to read something, right, but when you experience and you, you feel the emotional and the spiritual benefits, 
that's another you know, experience that really allows you to feel that, wow, this is right, this is right for me. Um, so that, those things were happening. At the same time, I was learning about this idea of life after death. Okay? And so from an Islamic perspective, I was basically learning that whatever seeds I sow in this life, I'm going to reap the reward of that in the next life. And I had someone who recently said to me, um, when you think of the soul, the soul is eternal. When you think of the soul being eternal, we're not talking about you know, a thousand years, we're not talking about a hundred thousand years, we're not talking about millions of years, we're talking about eternity. And so it got me thinking that, well, you know, let's just say I live on this planet for 80 years, right? What I do in that 80 years is going to impact the millions and millions of years of eternal life. So, to be honest, that's probably when I started to think, I've got to think for myself here. I can't rely on just what's happening, the fashion at the moment, or the, the philosophies that are going around. I've got to find my own answers, and it's got to be 100% foolproof for me. And so, with that understanding of, that transformed me as a person. So, rather than just living for this life, I started thinking, I've got to build myself for the next life. Because everything has an end, right? Every, everything in this life, is, it's temporary, right? And so I thought, first of all, I don't know when it's going to be my time to travel to the next life. And so, I started... Um, taking a very serious approach towards developing myself as a human being. And I found that Islam presented me with the tools that I needed in order to find those steps and make that progress and feel fulfilled as I was sort of journeying along as I have been over the last 20 years. And there's my son there. He's, <laughs> he's got um, holidays, so I thought I'd bring him along. So over the last 20 years, as I've been journeying and continuously um, seeking to learn about Islam, I found that it's like, it's like you were saying, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know, but at the same time, the more you're excited to learn more. And the more, more than anything, because um, we believe and, you know, that God has created us um, with this law of growth. He wants us to grow. He wants us to grow in this life, to, you know, to grow in terms of knowledge, knowledge that can help us in this life, right? but also knowledge for our soul that will allow us to transcend this life and to go to a higher level of connecting towards God. And so um, with that in mind, um, my understanding of God, let me just say a few things about it. Um, and that's something that now um, is, a, is, is a huge part of my life in terms of my consciousness. So, for example, I study the way in which I get to know God as a Muslim now is by studying his attributes. And we have what's called, and it's in the Quran, there are 99 attributes of God. And these are qualities of God that allow us to, to know God on a deep and intimate level. And the more that we contemplate and learn about that, and at the same time, the more that we are reciting those names, right, then it, it, it has allowed me to um, connect more to my Creator. And at the same time, I know that God is recognizing that I am seeking him and he is giving that knowledge because um, there's this famous um, saying by our prophet peace upon him, he said to spend one hour contemplating about God is better than 60 years of worship. Right? So he didn't mean that worship is, you know, is, 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 not, is not the way to go but what he meant was you, know, you can have someone who worships for 60 years and they never know God. So to contemplate about God, to sit and look at, for example, you know, when you look at the wonders of the universe, when you look at, you know, even zoom down into, a, you know, and think about, for example, a beautiful rose, and you think how beautiful it smells, the velvety feel of it, you know, the colour of it, the texture, right? Who is this artist behind it, right? Just like, say, you go to a museum and you see this amazing artwork and, you know, you want to get deeper to know the artist, right? Well. The Islamic perspective has taught me that this world is like an art exhibition, right? And God has put all the, all the beauties of creation here for us to ask who is this artist, magnificent artist behind it, and to want to get to know him and to learn more about his artistry and his greatness and his magnificence. And so that's sort of, in a nutshell, giving you an idea of, of um, ways in which a Muslim gets, and in, in my case as well, has gotten to know God on, on deeper levels. Um, how am I going with time? Right, five minutes. Keep going. Um.
Fifteen. Okay. Fifteen minutes left to go. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. So let me um, uh, then take you on on a journey in terms of um, the essential elements of, of Islam or beliefs that um, have allowed me to, um, you know, get, you know, practice my Islam. So I'll give you sort of a, a snapshot. So essentially, the the key um, belief. Um, that has guided me in my life is this idea of God's greatness. You know, that's why you, you know you hear Muslims here and there saying Allah Akbar. You know, God is great. You know, it's some. It's probably the key words that um, allows me to um, by contemplating on how great God is by getting to know Him more. Um, and it's something that throughout my day, right? Um, it um, can I say? <laughs> I was trying to it's something that allows me to continue to recognise, first of all, my position in relation to God, um, and at the same time, knowing how great God is, um, to, to, to get closer to Him. And this is something that I do through um, prayers. Heather talked about prayers. Probably one of the most important aspects of, um, of uh, my life as a Muslim and in terms of practice is the concept of prayer. Um, it's something that we do, as she mentioned, takes about perhaps between five, seven minutes um, each, each day, for fi uh, during, um, five times during the day. And during, those, um, during that time, it's a chance where I sort of say, okay, I'm forgetting the whole world and I'm reconnecting to my purpose. And it allows me to remember that, hey, you know, today could be my last day. It allows me to remember that, am I on track? Have I been conscious of God? Have I been conscious of being the best I can in terms of the way I relate to people, in terms of the way I treat my mum and dad, in terms of the way you know, I treat my family, in, in terms of my, my manners, my behaviours? So with that sort of consciousness, it sort of motivates me towards wanting to be continuously aware of, my, of, of, of the way uh, my intention is, first of all, the condition that's inside my heart, inside my mind, and the way in which I'm communicating. Um, so prayer has that important aspect where it's kind of like, you know, um, a reminder to me and a motivation throughout my day so that when, so that my life outside of the prayer actually becomes like a prayer where I'm meditating, I'm in that state of consciousness of God and I'm thinking about Him as I'm, you know, relating or talking to people. And I think that that's probably, you know, um, one of the, the ideals of prayer is so that your life outside of prayer becomes like a prayer. And prayer being a state of, like Heather was saying, a state of calm and tranquility, you know, a state of peace. We have this, there's a very famous hadith, um, a saying of our prophet, peace be upon him, where he says that patience is half of your faith. And that's a massive statement, isn't it? Patience is half of your faith. Because when you think about it, everything we do, you know, whether it's studying or, you know, um, shopping or, you know, any kind of action, you need a certain amount of patience if you expect to get a good outcome, isn't it? So if you expect to succeed in whatever it is you're doing and you don't have a chunk of patience to go with it, you won't succeed. And so this concept of patience is something that's very important in Islam and it's the key, really. It's one of the keys towards building yourself as, a, uh, you know, as, I've, as I've experienced towards becoming a better human being emotionally, mentally, spiritually, socially, etc. Okay, I might finish off um, there. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Aisha. Can you guys hear me at the back with this ridiculous mic system? Anyways, I don't even think it's working, but... So I'll shout as well. Um, thank you, Sister Aisha, for that. Um, uh, brothers and sisters and, and friends, my name is Faraz. Uh, I'll be your MC for the second part of today's event. Uh, it, was a, it was a tag team sort of a arrangement. I realized um, once I committed to being MC that I was actually meant to be teaching at this time. So I came back from a shoot, uh, ran back, finished early, told my students that I had to be somewhere important. Uh, hopefully none of them are in here, that would make things awkward. But um, <laughs> without further ado, um, what we're going to do uh, at this stage of the, of the talk today is we're going to uh, throw it all open uh, for you guys. If you've got any questions, 
Um, you know, it's quite interesting hearing the stories of how uh, people come to uh, another religion, not just Islam, um, how they sort of change what they've been thinking all their life um, and the process that they go through uh, in order to end up somewhere else. So I'm sure some of you might have some uh, inquiries you might want to make in that regard. Um, and if you do, this is your chance to uh, ask a question either to all the speakers or you can direct it uh, specifically to any one of our, of our, our speakers here today. So um, we'll throw it open and uh, hopefully we can get some discussion going on. Yes? As the lady, I think, uh, I didn't hear that lady because I came halfway. You said you were Catholic? Yes. Uh, did you have a Bible in your house? Tell me um, Can you hear me from here? Yeah. Yes, I did. And I used to read it as a teenager. And we used to attend, we used to have religion classes every week. Yes. What did you learn about Jesus? I learned that he had amazing qualities and probably the most beautiful qualities right were his qualities of compassion and mercy right and those were you know we you know there were many many prophets and each one had was a role model and each one had certain qualities and characteristics that was unique to them and my understanding of Jesus from the bible was that that was one of his greatest qualities and his quality of forgiving that no matter what he was able to forgive. Are you aware that I read the Quran and I find a lot of violence in it? Do not be friend oh, or Jew God. or Christian because you will be infidel like them. Thank you, thank you for raising that. There's a lot of verses in the in the Quran. It's all that killing. It's all killing and violence. Bible has no killing. Bible have love your enemy, pray for your persecutor. That's what the Bible says. Do you think you choose the right way? Do you know why you didn't choose the right way? Because the Catholics don't teach the Bible. I learned it for seven no, years. they don't teach Bible. Ma'am, we'll leave it. Okay, that's, that's fine. Your... Thank you. Let me just add to that. Thank you for, for your opinion. You know, it's great that, okay. you know, you say that. And it's important for us to hear that, you know. And it's important also to hear someone else's opinion. Um, I have studied the Bible in depth. Um, and I've studied the Quran in depth. I've also studied different um, interpretations, right? Just as there are very negative interpretations of the Bible, I don't have those negative interpretations. Um, likewise, there are people who can take a word and, and, and change the meaning, right, without knowing the context. So all I can tell you is that I have read the Quran, I have analysed it, I have studied it, right? And there is nothing in there that does not um, teach me about peace, right? There are certain, if, you, if it's okay to continue, there are certain verses, like the one you mentioned, about um, uh, not befriending Christians. Those are taken out of context, right? So in that regard, it's referring to people if they're oppressing you. So you need to actually study the stories behind it. So anyone who is oppressing you, it's basically saying not to befriend that person, right? And I think you would probably, you know, understand. That verse was a specific verse about. You've asked your question yeah, now. Okay, we'll answer. Is salvation, you get it from Jesus. Absolutely, you get it from Jesus. It from Jesus. He said, "I'm the beginning, I'm the end." Okay. He said, "I testify for this prophecy. Who I will take or air? I'll take his name from the book of life and the Holy Spirit." Come, Jesus, come. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, we believe as a Muslim that salvation is not through any of the, the prophets that were, ma were men. We believe that salvation can only come from the divine. And we believe that in our heart of hearts, when I meet my creator, he will look at my heart. And he will look at my actions. And that's what will matter. Right? Not the politics and all the other stuff. Where so, you thank you. We love Jesus. Muslims, Muslims love Jesus and we want to be like Jesus. And that specific verse that you're referring to in the Quran is... If you're not going to listen, why are you here? Can you please, can you please let uh, Pavel ask please? No, we don't deny Jesus. We love Jesus. Muslims, Muslims, uh, Muslims love Jesus. Muslims love Jesus. You should have come to the talk about Jesus, I think. Were you here today? <laughs> Zero. Zero. Okay, maybe we go. No, 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 thanks. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Had to say. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll give, the, uh, give the channel. I think we we heard you out quite well. Um, some absurd claims at the end there, but we'll realise. Um, can we please have other questions? Yes. Um, in a similar 
Oh, uh, not in a similar map. Well, um, you mentioned how you, how you justify um, the diff varying levels of inequality throughout the world. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't catch um, your explanation. Just to catch it. Is it a problem when I was talking about early on in my teenage years how I used to question God? Is that what you mean? Yeah, so, so through, through Islam, how, how do you explain? Okay, uh, so the question is, he's saying that, he's referring to when I was saying that before I converted to Islam, I was questioning, well, if there's so much injustice in the world, how can there be a God? And so my, under, and so my perspective now about that as a Muslim is that any injustice that exists, if you look at it, right, with, um, the, with, with the facts, right, you will always see that it comes back to humankind. So, for example, the state of the environment now, right, hasn't happened by magic. We've created, you know, an environment on this earth that is where you have resources being depleted, where you have, you know, countries, um, you know, where you have natural disasters, where you have global warming, right? Deaths and um, things where um, you know you have un, um, you know deaths of, for example, you know you see an innocent person being killed, or you know in in that case, whatever's happening in the condition of the heart of the human being, I believe, is manifested, right? So because we are all connected as one, right? I believe that whatever's happening within us is also being manifested around us. So I don't know. Does that sort of answer your question? Um, God's given us that? free will, so um, yeah, it, humans are the ones that create all this evil. God creates us and then gives us choice. So because of the choices that people make, then there's suffering in the earth. But what we believe as Muslims is that every single bit of suffering you get, even if you trip and, and hurt your leg, that God will reward you for that. So people in this life that may appear to be suffering a lot, in heaven will probably be given a higher place. Um, and every, we can't have good without having bad. So if we didn't ever have bad, we wouldn't know what God is, uh, what good is, sorry. So we need to have these, you know, like I was saying, I don't know, you may have missed my um, bit, but what, if we don't have tests in our life, then we'll never be better. If we don't have a time when we feel alone and we, we feel like we can't depend on anyone, we're never going to get to a point where we feel independent and confident in ourselves and have self-esteem. So... God knows what's best and everyone has different tests and trials in their life and it's up to us to look at it and say, okay, I've got a, a learning experience here in this test and to try and develop ourselves and get better. But unfortunately, as Aisha was saying, society is very selfish and negative and you know, we've lost touch with God and so it just becomes more and more negative spiralling down. I can't answer the question, not really. Yeah, it's... it's, it's... <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, any others who would want to direct an inquiry towards our speakers? No question is too controversial. Feel free to. Um, um, the Vietnamese, sorry, Vietnamese. Um, Peter. Okay, yeah, um, did you uh, look at any other religions other than Islam? Uh, I, I looked at some comparative uh, stuff because my friend uh, during high school he used to tell me about Christianity and uh, another friend would come and oppose that because he's an atheist. He used to point out contradictions in the Bible and, and such. So uh, I didn't look into it that much. I looked into Islam first before comparing everything and seeing that that encompassed a lot more than what the other religions provided. So also, you said that um, when your father was going to church, but you said your mum was telling you to be Buddhist. So church was... Uh, well, she sent me to church mainly to learn Vietnamese because it's a Vietnamese church. And, oh, and, sorry? Uh, not, not when I was... I never really practiced Buddhism. My, my mother never imposed that on me. It only became an issue when I adopted something else. Yeah, that happened to me too. I've got a question. Yep. yep. Um, so your dad was Muslim and your mom was Catholic. Um, did you ever come across, what did you think of the original sin? In Christianity? Yeah. The original, the question was what did I think of the original sin? Um, there was a lot of, that's probably one of the, the, the concepts that confused me, I have to admit. Because I didn't believe that, um, it's like I was saying to the lady who was here that 
um, you know, God, I believe that it's only just and fair to expect that a, a God who is just and fair will judge me according to my intentions in this life, the sincerity that I've strived for, the actions that I've tried to do in my life. So I didn't believe in this pre, you know, this notion of, you know, something that's happened to someone else is going to affect me. You know? Yes, brother. Which one? This is a bit controversial, but um, when you were trying, when you were in the process of becoming Muslim, the, the image of Islam ever in the in the Europe course of something like the current image that we have today. No, we'll get all three speakers to give an answer on that. Let's find out what they Sister, would you like to start? Yeah, I can't. I can't actually remember thinking anything negative about Islam. Mum brought us up that every religion was good, and I remember when September 11 happened. Mum was like, you know, those poor Muslims that live here because they're the ones that are going to suffer. Um, so I think she brought us up to accept that every religion is is good. But like Peter was saying, once I decided to become Muslim, well, <laughs> not every religion was good. You can't become Muslim and Muslim men bash their wives and. Things like this, that's what Mum said. But yeah, I never took that on for myself. Alhamdulillah. Um, I think the only time I had the negative ideas about Islam was as a teenager. And it was once in a blue moon, you know, you'd see someone from far or maybe on the news where you'd see a woman wearing a scarf. And so you'd think in the way that you've been brought up in a Western culture that, you know, if she doesn't look like this, then, you know, um, this must mean such and such. So, yes, I did believe that women were oppressed. I did believe that, you know, <clears throat> Islam was a barbaric religion. Um, and it was just things that, you know, you'd hear things here and there. But, you know, as I said earlier, I didn't really investigate that. And, um, you know, so, yeah. But, you know, alhamdulillah that by seeing Muslims who are, you know, true Muslims, I was able to, you know, learn, um, be inspired towards wanting to know more about Islam. Yeah. Uh, for me, I wasn't really connected to what was happening around the world when I was younger. And when September 11 actually did happen when I was in primary school, I had no idea what that was about. I remember my teacher told me to write how you would feel as if you were um, uh, as a part of uh, the, one of the people that were in the vicinity. And I, all I could imagine was that a piece of wood fell on my head. But, um, but, but today, but that was nowhere compared to how it's um, portrayed today. I, like even still, my, only my family started pointing out uh, stereotypes and, and portrayed image of Muslims after I became a Muslim, with my dad labeling them as like uh, now to terrorists because uh, we lived because uh, we live across the street from the mosque, but. Not really, but I didn't really, um, didn't really have any of those preconceived um, notions that I had before. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sister. Um, I have a question for the brother because I'm an I'll convert myself and I'm a Chinese. So I was wondering. Um, so my mom's kind of not practicing Buddhist, but so I was just wondering: Have you tried to explain Islam to your parents? And if you have, have how, like, because I, I do want to explain Islam to my parents, but it's so difficult and they don't really understand. Uh, well, for me, my Vietnamese isn't so great, so I can see how this church uh, would have come in handy. So it's a bit hard when there's a language barrier. So for me, uh, I've been trying to find uh, someone who's Vietnamese and uh, a Muslim as well to try to explain the concepts better. But uh, I, I try to explain where I can the very simple, very simple things that um, what's promoted in Islam, such as uh, care to care to my mother. Um, but also sometimes I ask my neighbour to try and talk to her because I'm not sure why, but two people with broken English talking to each other kind of works better than me trying to explain it. <laughs> so yeah. It's probably because she, I found with my mum, mum doesn't want to hear it from me. And so I pray to Sikara a lot, you know, we have a prayer, and for anyone who doesn't know, in Islam that um, we can ask God for guidance, and we ask God if we should go a certain way. And I pray to Sikara a lot before I spoke to my mum. 
um, because I thought, should I just tell her, oh, look, I'm Muslim, this is it, this is what you've got to deal with and be done with it? Um, but I got no, and just should I say this to mum? Should I tell her that I'm praying? Should I tell her, you know, bits and pieces? And I got yes for a couple of them, but in the end, mum was going out and researching herself. She wanted to hear it from me. She wanted to go and investigate it herself. So all I would say is make dua, praise to Cara about what you should talk to her about, and, and make dua that Allah will inspire you with the right things for her, because everyone needs different um, aspects of Islam to, for it to click for them or whatever. But I think it was too hurtful for mum to hear it from me. It's hurtful to have a Muslim daughter. I feel almost like, um, because I've got sort of the other extreme where my mum was like, well, if you're happy, I'm happy, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's also because she grew up with Jewish friends, Muslim friends, Catholic friends, you know, and so she grew up at a time where you just treated everyone with respect, you know, and so she didn't have this you know, um, bitterness towards Muslims. Um, and at the same time, she was saying, look, you know, you seem more relaxed, more at peace. You know, it's making you a better person. So she just took it from that perspective, you know? Yeah. Yes, sister. Okay. Um, I have a question for our sister Aisha and sister Lula. Um, when did you first put on hijab? And how did, you put, what, how did you feel when you first put it on? And what was the reaction? Of people around you. <laughs> I was at uni, it was pretty scary. <laughs> um, so we're talking about like early 90s. Um, so yeah, I, I coaxed myself into it because I, I, even though it was early on, I only like after about sort of 10 months of learning about Islam, but I knew I wanted to do it, I, I knew the wisdom behind it. And I had experienced it, like, on, on one occasion. And, it, you know, aside from all the logical reasons and the spiritual reasons, I actually liked it. It, it felt really nice wearing it. <laughs> um, so I had told my friends that I'm going to wear it, so just to prepare them. <laughs> so I showed up on one shoot wearing it, and they were like... <laughs> trying to wear it as much as I can. I, I struggle with it a lot. Um, not from what people think, I don't give a crap about what people think, but I struggle with the, like, just having things just being covered all the time, you know. I like exercise a lot. But the reason why I want to put it on is because I trust in God, you know. Everything else that I thought surely isn't right about Islam, I do it and, you know, I get so many benefits. So I trust that God, what God tells me to do is what is right. So a couple of months ago, I had decided to put it on. I was like, yeah, I'm going to put on a work. I researched all about hijabs, like police officers that wear hijabs. And, and I was going to go into work and everything. Anyway, you know, it was stopped for a reason. But, um, yeah, I'm just trying to wear it as much as I can and hope that one day I just won't want to take it off. So I'm feeling better about it. I don't have to laugh, but... Thanks for that, sisters. Any other questions? All right. Yep, at the back there. what they like and maybe, you know, what's stopping you or something like that so that they, it, it builds up a conversation so that you can say what you like or whatever. Because you've got to figure out what different people are interested in and what is the hesitation, you know. So you've got to be able to address that specific issue for them. Yeah. I was just going to add one thing that the most important thing I would tell them that is it's between you and God, right? And just work on your relationship between you and your creator. You know, just keep, um, you know, seeking to know him more, relying on him. Doa, which is the highest form of worship, you know, and a sign of your iman. So, because despite whatever, you know, other the other things will, ta will have its place, but this is what the whole purpose of Islam is, to become nearer towards your creator. So, I would tell her that that's the most important thing. Take it at your own pace, 
at what feels right. It, she, ha, she or he has to be comfortable 100%. And you will only do that as the faith grows and grows, you know, and that, that faith will give you certainty and give you a higher level of understanding and wisdom about things, you know. So I wouldn't worry about the rules or the this or the anything except that initially. And then as they become wanting to take it to the next step or want to start praying or fasting, then I would, you know, um, introduce them to those. Yeah, just to pretty much emphasize that is to, um, for the pace, to go at their pace, but also before and after they um, uh, embrace Islam to not go, oh, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, and you can't do this. <laughs> so I think it's important to just emphasize um, um, that when they're ready, they'll be ready, and to also be there when they, when they need something. Yeah, we all start from, you know, when we think back to when we first reverted, how, you know, we would have seen us, bits, it would seem like we were unpracticing and, you know, but if people are given time, inshallah, they'll, they'll do the right thing. But yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the name was and we can't do this. <laughs> we have a question at the front here, yes. Um, yeah, uh, so I'm not sure you're going back to lady in the middle. You mentioned um, about like a spectrum and kind of the things that you do in this life um, because God is just will impact on like the eternity to come. Um, I was just wondering, uh, I don't know a lot about um, Islam, but uh, can you know before you die um, whether you will like have a good eternity or a bad eternity? Or is there a sense of uncertainty and you only find out when you die? Or um, like what kind of assurance can you have about life after? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, um, even our own prophet, peace be upon him, you know, he, you know, he's the role model in this in that he never, um, you know, uh, he, he always emphasised that that's an area of uncertainty. Because if there was certainty, then I would be complacent and comfortable. Well, you know, I say my prayers, that's it, I'll get to paradise, I don't need to worry about anything else, you know. So having that level of uncertainty continues to motivate me towards striving, you know, um, which is the, the, the most important concept, constantly striving to better yourself. Um, but at the same time, you're hopeful. You know that God is merciful, He's compassionate, and He is aware of... What you, what's going on in your heart, in your in your mind, and so you have that's that's where the faith kicks in, and you have that faith that you know he will be pleased with what you're doing, and he will give you that peace that you seek, you know, in the next life, and give you that ability to be with the people you love, to, to see God Himself, you know, which is one which is probably the highest achievement in paradise. We believe is to see God Himself, you know. Very much. Any others? Yes. Hello. I just have a question for uh, Sister Rafi, uh, who is Christian. Are you a Christian? <laughs> <laughs> Both of us. Okay. And then, uh, is that the green? Were you Christian before? Green. Oh, Asia. It's Asia, yes. Yes, yes I was. Catholic. Uh, yeah. okay. I just have a question. Uh, when you were Christian, were you aware that there was. Uh, to think outside. You're just taught this is the Bible, this is the only Bible and that's it. You know, and so you study the Bible. Um, you don't study about the history of how it was compiled or who compiled it. Um, I don't know, maybe in, in, in studies of religion you might, but back in my days it wasn't. Um, and so um, it's, you know, it's the case that people, you know, in their adult years, 
who want to look at the historical side of the Bible will will see. It's a fact, it's evident, it's out there in the public that yes, there are the Bible has been changed, it has gone through, you know, um, a series of tra um, translations and and, and, um, and whatnot. Um, but their, their argument is that, uh, well, it still has um, the, 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 the divine hand in it, so to speak. You know, that, for example, whoever wrote it was inspired by God. And so that's sufficient for them, right, who, who accept that. I personally, because everyone is different, I thought, well, hold on, if God is so great, right, and I'm here on this earth for a short time, right, um, why couldn't he preserve his, his message to humanity. That was my query, that I wasn't happy with, with that argument. So I remember once I was at a lecture and I heard the lecturer saying that the Qur'an, even if you don't accept it as the word of God, um, it was the, the, the Qur'an itself, which was revealed 1400 years ago, every letter and, and um, a word and whatever has not changed. Not one single letter or vowel has changed since it was revealed. And Western and, and non, uh, Muslim and non-Muslim scholars will attest to that. And so I thought that's a really huge, you know, argument to say and, and pretty strong, you know, thing to say about the Quran. And so when I started studying it and, and learning about Islam, for me that was sufficient to say, wow, well God actually did preserve his final um, uh, message to humanity. Yes, Faraz. The question is to any of the speakers, and it's pretty much asking, um, what do you think is the best way to actually get uh, dawah? I mean, I think it's a very important question that should be asked amongst the Muslim community today, because it's people like you that are, you know, the fruits of what dawah is to all of us. So you guys have been on both sides of the fence, and you guys have been the recipients of dawah, and now you're like giving dawah. So what do you think is the best approach um, when talking to non-Muslims and giving them love about Islam? Uh, well, it depends uh, who you're approaching, uh, such as your neighbour, who you see every now and then, it would be, who, who isn't a Muslim, it would be good to uh, give him snippets or something, you know, just uh, small portions of it every every time you see them or something like that, or or in my case, if you live in the Kemba, across the street from the mosque, you can just say, oh yeah, what they're doing now, they're going to pray and stuff like that. So it just really depends on who you're um, giving dawah to. Dawah for our numbers of friends means invitation to Islam. Yeah. Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the question is basically, um, what's the best approach to invite someone to Islam? Okay. Because I've seen a lot of people think they just plainly get it wrong. Okay. Um, I think the best approach is to be yourself, um, to let them see how, to let them see Islam through you, through the way you are, because I personally think that's enough. If you are standing for Islamic principles and striving, then they will see something different, you know, and they will connect to that, because this Islam is a religion of the heart, and people connect through the heart, and, um, and so, you know, your friendship to them, your love, your kindness, you know, um, that will speak much more than any words. Um, and, in, well, and of course the words are important, so at the same time, you know, I would be conscious of saying things to inspire them, you know, whether it's sayings of, um, you know, profound sayings such as, you know, um, some of the, you know, virtues that we all aspire to, or, you know, quotes or things here and there, you know, um, or things about God, you know, really inspiring things that will make them, will sort of put seeds about about God and about our our responsibility towards knowing who God is and understanding that, so, something along those lines. Yeah, what Aish says, the best thing you can do is just be an excellent Muslim. Unfortunately, as Muslims, because there's so much negative stereotypes, we have to be even better. So when we want to get angry at someone, we have to think, no, we can't, because they're going to look at us and think, oh, you Muslims are whatever. So the best thing that we can do is treat everybody with respect, is to treat everyone how we'd like to be treated, to be patient, to be the best Muslims we can. 
and you know, hopefully in time they will come to then grow to trust you and ask you questions about it. People are curious, but we have to be patient, unfortunately, and just give it time for them to become accustomed to us and see that these are Muslim qualities, not the criminals that we see and the people in the street, go down the streets of the camera in Auburn and it's disgusting, a pig star, people hooning around. Like, there's so many negative um, stereotypes that we just have to be better, unfortunately. Because we don't want to be the peak. Yeah. Well, fortunately, yeah, that's right. It's our test, you know, and it helps us to be better. But, um, yeah, people don't want to be preached to. If someone had started to talk to me about Islam, I would have been like, whoa, back off. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to come to it ourselves. Um, so I'm sorry, I actually missed your presentation, so I missed, um, so if, I, if you already discussed this, then you can my question, but um, I was actually just having a long discussion with a brother who just recently became Muslim, and something that came out of the discussion was um, with fundamental philosophical challenges and difficulties that people have with Islam, once you become Muslim, how do you deal with those? So, I mean, you can think of issues about fate and destiny, you can think about capital punishment, any fundamental philosophical issue, you can name it. Once you become Muslim, and now you've accepted Islam and you're submitted to the Quran and the Prophet and the following teaching, how do, you still, how do you deal with those challenges? Do you sort of just say, I accept them, or do you say, I accept them conditionally? How do you, how do you deal with them? And that's something that I'm interested to hear. I'm not sure I understand if it challenges about a non-Islamic concept, or what do you mean? And as in, like, there's, there's obviously a lot of philosophical concepts in Islam that yeah. people will challenge. That you might not agree with, uh, maybe. That you might not agree with. For example, you might say, and this is an open challenge about Islam, is that, um, well, if there's faith, um, that's, if God is all knowing and, and faith is, 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 is determined, predestined, and everything, then how does free will come into it? Yeah, but so it's not, example, that's not Islamic. Well, it's it's not exactly, I guess it's, it could be a universal discussion, but I mean, it's something that when you come to Islam, you have to accept a set of principles, almost. Yeah. And when you have those challenges that you have in your own life, and once you've come to Islam and embrace Islam, okay. do you still have those challenges? Do you have to try to deal with them? I'm just yeah, interested. Yeah, uh, Like for me, I believed that the Quran was the word of God. That's how I started. And so I accepted that everything in the Quran was from God. And so um, once I did that, I... And once you start practicing, you, you realize everything that God tells us to do is the best for us and, you know, it all works out. But so anything that I have a problem with, I then think, okay, well, there must be wisdom in it, and then I'll go and research and find out exactly what it is. You just have to do your research and find out. Everything that God tells us to do is what's right for us. But we have to find it for ourselves, you know. That's the beauty. We can continue learning forever. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. Just... Um learning more about the, the issue itself, but knowing uh, with confirmation that the Qur'an is the word of God and that He knows what's best for us. So anything that uh, is prescribed upon us is is what's best for us because He knows us better than we do. But also that um, that since we're st still starting out, we wouldn't have a whole encompassment of the knowledge. So just further research would be the best thing to do. Any other questions? We might take one more from the floor. If we don't. Yep, yeah, sister? Did you miss the talks? <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. For Peter and me, we we looked at the um, the scientific proofs in the Quran and the fact that the Quran was the word of God. Is that right, Peter? Did I make it up? <laughs> oh, and then onto the linguistics. And oh, the linguistics, yeah. yeah. And eight.
meeting a Muslim, you know, they study it, you know, and um, they look at it in depth and, um, and, it all, and it all makes sense to them. But I, from my experience, the majority have always had that initial human contact where <clears throat> they felt something special about someone, uh, particular qualities or characteristics, you know, and often it started off with friendship, right? And, um, and so I have to emphasize that it's the friendship aspect that's very important. Um, problem is, sometimes Muslims shy off and think that, oh, you know, I might become, you know, lose my, my characteristics if I mix with non-Muslims. But you have to have a level of confidence in what you believe, right? And, and know why you're believing it. Um, and at the same time, like, um, be aware of you know, things that are impinging on that. So if you find yourself, you know, um, doing something that's not within your values, then you take note of that, you know. But at the same time, I think if you're conscious of who you are, conscious of God, then that will guide you towards, you know, your relationships with others um, and treating everyone in the best way possible, regardless of who they are, you know. I think, um, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there, everyone, uh, because I see people watering outside ready to come in and grab a chair for the next lecture. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, firstly, there are refreshments uh, that will be served outside uh, this room when you go out, so please be sure to grab those. Uh, secondly, um, for those who weren't able to ask questions or have got more questions to ask, you can hopefully mingle with the speakers unless they have to rush off. Um, thirdly, we are having a stall uh, every day of the Islamic Awareness Fortnight. Um, outside the, the library, in the library walkway, so please feel free to come over there, discuss with us, mingle with us, um, you know, grab a few things, uh, pamphlets and whatnot. And then finally, um, if you haven't, then please make sure you grab a flyer, which has the details for the upcoming week's uh, events. So we've got a fortnight, so it continues into next week. Uh, plenty of other good events to come, uh, so make sure you attend some of those as well, and uh, hopefully gain a bit more insight to Islam. Thank you very much. I uh, hope everyone for coming here.